Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the future. I'm Zach Gardner, the Chief Architect at Keyhole Software. And three to four months ago, I embarked on sort of a journey. I wanted to find people that were interested in sharing their experiences, both positive as well as negative with me on generative AI. These are people that range from banking, finance, investing, healthcare, defense, pretty much every sector that I could get agree to talk with me. These are people that have real world experiences that have a lot of information that they just, they wanna get out, they wanna share, and they wanna let you all know kind of where their head's at, what are the things that excites them, maybe what are some of the things that they're worried about. Today with me, I have Alex Gloy, who's a Chief Investment Officer out of New York. Alex, thank you very much for agreeing to be on the show. Thank you for having me. Oh, the, the pleasure is all mine. So, you know, you have a very long, you know, very tenured career. And I can say that because I got gray hairs too. You know, my, uh, my gray hair aren't as numerous as yours, but that's okay. I'm, I'm slowly getting there. <laughs> I'm curious if you could spend, you know, maybe a few minutes talking to me about, you know, what, what's your experience been as a chief investment officer, someone who's been around investing, you know, their whole life, as it relates to machine learning, what are some maybe interesting things that you run across? Like maybe a good place to start is like, where's your first memory of, you know, really interacting and encountering this in the respect of, you know, investing? Yeah, that was uh, probably in the, in the mid nineties uh, when I worked on the trading floor of a big Swiss bank out of Zurich. And I was a sales trader and uh, electronic trading had just begun. So, um, we were uh, sales trading some customer orders. And so you have a couple of orders on hand. And, and um, let's say there was a stock that traded a few thousand shares a day. And the client came in and said, I have 10,000 to sell. And if you, sell, if you throw them on the market at once, you, you destroy the price. You give the client a bad execution. He's not happy. So you have to... Uh, you have to slowly um, set it for the day and see if there's some volume. And if there's volume, then you participate. So the instruction is usually like, don't be more than one third of volume or something like that. And uh, it was a small industrial company called Bucher. And they, they make uh, typical Swiss conglomerate. They make uh, winemaking equipment. They sell to Napa Valley. And they made uh, municipal cleaning machines like poop scoopers for uh, the, the city of Paris and stuff like that. So so completely weird. But the, the value guys, they love this kind of stuff because usually undervalued people don't see synergies and there are none. And uh, so this trades a couple of thousand shares a day and I have to sell 10 or 20,000. And uh, there's absolutely nothing going on. And the market maker is there. He always has to make a bid and then asks so a price where he buys and a price where he sells and you can you can fill him like he's probably good for a few hundred shares and then once you fill that bid the price drops lower he he doesn't want to get totally filled at that price and then he sits with ten thousand shares there and cannot get rid of them because at the end of the day he, he preferentially wants wants to be flat and but nothing happens, so I think okay, I have to show the client something. So I I, I see six hundred shares a bid, and I sell five hundred, so that hundred are left over, and the bid doesn't go away. And um, I see a volume five hundred, and a second later I I look and I see volume thousand, and somebody else sold in the exact same second or one second later. And I thought, oh, that's that's odd, what a coincidence. And then around lunchtime, I sold another 500 shares. And again, same thing happened one second later, another 500 shares uh, printed. And um, so I've, I figured out that there was an algorithm. Uh, somebody had programmed something that uh, whatever the volume was, uh, he or she would participate with the same amount. So to be half of the volume of the day. And then came uh, the end of the trading day, the closing auction. And I had a few thousand shares left over and there was a good bid in the market. And I, I, I thought, wait, if I now sell like two and a half thousand shares and 
I basically uh, suffocate the, the bid. And then the algorithm has to come in and do another two and a half thousand, the price is going to tank. And that's exactly what happened. And so I got my two and a half out at a good price. And then the algorithm got a very bad price because this is like seconds before the close. And uh, so I was able to go to my client and give him a, a good execution relative to the to the average price of the day. And that was that was the first encounter with uh, with a trading algorithm. And it was yeah, uh, more than 25 years ago. Yeah, a few, a few things have changed probably since then, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Generative I mean, AI I, and, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, just saying that now algorithmic trading is more than 70% of the volume at the New York Stock Exchange. Because, I mean, I a good sales trader, maybe he can handle... 10 orders a day, but more than that, you get overwhelmed, you mess up executions, and, and usually the, the, the algorithms are much better than humans in, in handling this stuff. Uh, this was a particular case because it was such an illiquid stock, but normally you, they're, they're very, you know, a human can only handle so much. Mm -hmm. No, that's <clears throat> machines are good at a lot of things. I think, you know, human beings, we might place too much stock in them at certain times. Like machines are really good at, you know, very fast computations. They're not good at things like emotions or they're not good at feelings, which can be good, you know, in certain circumstances. I know there's a lot of traders out there that have probably gotten into revenge trading that have been, you know, sort of, they think that they can sort of outsmart the market or it's like, oh, you know, I just got burned on two trades, you know, I'm just going to have my little emotions, my, uh, my primate brain from, you know, when we're out, you know, just wherever in, in the rainforest or just kind of try to take over. And, you know, it's like, oh, the market's going to burn you every single time when you try to do something like that. Absolutely. There's there's a whole branch of investing called behavioral investing and uh, uh, trying to take advantage of these known biases of humans. And, um, uh, you know, when you can look at sentiment and that usually the the herd is wrong and stuff like that. Um, it's not. It's not watertight. The correlations come and go. But uh, yeah, it's it's a whole branch of investing. Uh, another area where algorithms came in is uh, in um, the news media. So when a company reports, let's say Apple Q4 earnings, the people write, or they used to write previews, like this is what we expect in sales, this is what EPS earnings per share is gonna be like. And it's, uh, I mean, it's totally boring. You you look up the consensus and you you, you have to regurgitate and, and and put this into, into an article. And so algorithms, uh, can write earnings previews now. And then on the other side, there are algorithms that can analyze uh, news as soon as it comes out um, and uh, trade on it. I mean, I was I was at a trade fair in New York City many years ago, and I was I was shocked that there was a, a firm offering uh, this kind of um, algorithmic trading for retail investors for uh, for one or two grand, you could buy the software and the software would analyze news releases and you could train it and then and then uh, trade on the on the back of this. I don't know how good or bad it is, but uh, th so this was at least 10 years ago. Uh, so this this stuff has been happening in the markets for for quite some time. One of the oh, 10 years ago, that would have been 2019. Around that time is when, just kind of thinking about investing, when I started hearing about Bitcoin, I actually remember one of my college roommates mined, I want to say like 50 Bitcoin back in uh, 2008, 2009. It, it, was, it was pretty early on um, from what I remember. And he was like, I don't really see the point in this. And then he sold it for like, you know, fractions of a penny. And he's kicking himself, you know, he's, he's done quite well for himself since then. Uh, you know, I, I won't say who it is, but he knows exactly who it is if he's listening to this. So <laughs> I'm curious what's, because like in, in thinking through, you know, like a lot of the major revolutions that have happened, you know, being able to have high frequency computing, be able to do algorithmic trading, like that's been one of the major, you know, innovations that have hit 
the investing field. The biggest one, I think, at least in you know my sort of dilettante understanding after that, would probably be like Bitcoin, like the rise of these like cryptocurrencies as a way to like democratize, so to speak, currency and getting it away from you know sort of fiat institutions. I'm curious what your you know kind of experience has been in terms of you know the the Bitcoin revolution, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, it is revolutionary I mean, it is a quite beautiful idea. And uh, I think I happened to read the white paper in 2014 or so, and I found it super interesting. Uh, uh, I mean, it's it's only 11 pages, two pages of footnotes, and uh, you, every, anybody can read it. It's so, um, it's really written for the layman and you can, you can, uh, understand that it came out of the whole Lehman uh, uh, disaster and the, the great financial crisis because, I mean, our ATMs almost stopped working uh, and the whole system almost went down, right? So it was born out of this crisis. And um, uh, I was interested and then uh, came Ethereum and then came some other coins and I thought, okay, the but then the non-inflationary argument of Bitcoin is kind of um, a moot point because uh, if anybody can, uh, the barriers of entry are basically zero. You just come up with another coin and uh, uh, forget about it. And then my client started asking me, should I buy Bitcoin? Should I buy this coin, Jesus coin, this coin? And uh, I, I, Try to discourage them, for which they were initially very mad, and then later, of course, was their idea not to buy. Um, but uh, and I, I got reinterested from a from a monetary perspective because, of course, it sounds great. Like you have a, you have something that doesn't lose value over time, like. Uh, dollars or euros or even other currencies that fare much worse. And um, uh, it sounds like a fantastic idea uh, that you know governments or central banks cannot print it, there's limited issue. And so you know that it ha should have some sort of value um, or kind of keep it over time. But then when... It, when you really think it through, it's the question is, can it be a good, can it function as money? And uh, money is of course a store of value, means of exchange and uh, medium of account, unit of account. And medium of exchange, I mean, if, if Bitcoin really became money and uh, limited issues why, why why would you exchange bitcoin for anything uh because it should appreciate constantly uh, meaning we would be constantly living in a deflationary environment and um so the the exchange part i mean a, a, all the bitcoin fans they talk about uh hodling but if everybody hodls there's no exchange of bitcoin and the, the beauty of fiat really is that it's such a, it's such a perfect medium of exchange. It, it reduces friction of, of um, interacting in, in the economy to, to an absolute minimum. It's not a great store of value over long runs, sure, given, but uh, I think uh, something that serves as money can either be a great store of value or a great medium of exchange, but not both. That would be asking too much. Um, and then if you think about it from a government perspective, I mean, governments, um, most of them run deficits because uh, the first government that tries austerity is usually thrown out by the voters. And if they can print Bitcoin, then how would they finance uh, the budgets? Uh, they can't. Um, so then it would be would be a problem. And even even Germany with their eight percent current account surplus, even they were not able to stick to the the Maastricht criteria of uh, three percent uh, fiscal deficit to GDP. If even Germany can't uh, can't adhere to this, how? 
other countries like the US that now has between seven and 9% fiscal deficit and uh, is a perennial fiscal deficit country. It's just, uh, it, 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 it wouldn't work. The people would revolt. So my contention is that, uh, yes, you could have a Bitcoin-based monetary system, but only in a dictatorship. <laughs> and is, is that really worth it, you know? Um, uh, and uh, it, 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 it um, so I think it's, it's, it's a, f a very good idea. It's a great technology, but as, as money, as paradoxically as the sounds, it's, it's too hard, uh, uh, as a money would be like a gold standard. And there's a reason why we went off the gold standard. It's just too hard. You would have deflationary periods and then that, uh, if that persists, it, it just kills the banking system and, and, uh, nobody benefits from that. Yeah, no, for sure. And I'm curious if you could talk for a few minutes, maybe on. I always, I always get the acronym wrong. I'm going to try to say it right this time. CBDC. It's Central Banking Digital Currency. Did I say it right? Central Bank Digital Currency. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, what is this thing? Because it's is this a new like Bitcoin? Like like how, like how does it compare in terms of you know? Uh, I don't know if it's going to be as revolutionary, but I'm just curious to get your take on it. So um, it's, you know, first, I, I didn't get it either because most of our money supply is already digital. We have maybe 2.3 trillion of uh, currency, meaning dollar bills and coins in circulation, although 70 something percent is, is outside of the country. So the US economy runs on something like 600 billion in cash or so, which is a, a tiny fraction of all the money uh, in circulation. I've, if you include Euro dollars, I think the, there's something like 160 trillion, 170 trillion uh, dollars outstanding in total. So the the cash part is is like less than half a percent. So 99.5 is already digital. So the question is, what, why do we need CBDC? And uh, it's a bit tricky because uh, it goes into uh, the difference between public and private money. Public money is money issued by the central bank. The central bank issues the dollar uh, bills, the coins, um, and they issue bank reserves. It's um, money that commercial banks have at an account at a, at a Federal Reserve. But you and I, we, we cannot have accounts with the Federal Reserve. We have accounts with private uh, commercial banks like Citi, Chase, Bank of America, and so on. And when we bring our cash to the bank, uh, a dollar note is a liability of the of the Federal Reserve of the central bank. A euro note is a liability of the European Central Bank, and so forth. As soon as we go into the bank and we deposit that, we have exchanged that liability of a public institution that cannot go bankrupt into a liability of a private institution that, in theory, has bankruptcy risk. So it's a uh, it has become a different. Animal, we have a, we are, we are now, we have an unsecured claim against a private institution. So it's, uh, it's basically like a stable coin. Um, so when we, you know, we think about our bank deposits being our money, but it's just, it's just a claim. Uh, the bank doesn't have enough money in the vault, enough cash in the vault to pay out all depositors and. The, the entire banking system doesn't have enough cash to pay out all deposits. Total deposits in the U.S. is like something like 17 trillion, and uh, as we heard before, there are about 600 billion in, in circulation. So, if everybody wanted their their deposits, uh, there would be enough public money. And now we will transform to a cashless society. I mean, this cash is just outdated. It's tedious for the for the cashier to handle it. Uh, you constantly have to give change. Uh, as a consumer, you have to carry it around. Um, 
and um, uh, in some European countries, there's uh, like Sweden is the most cashless society, probably with ninety eight percent of transactions purely digital. Uh, that's probably where we go, where we end up going. But if cash goes away, the central bank has no way uh, to reach us with public money. And um, public money is the peg that gives all the private money uh, its value. Uh, because as long as you know that you could go to the bank and withdraw up to certain daily limits your money and get cash for it, risk-free cash, you, you're fine. But if cash goes away, you're, you know, you're money will forever stay in the, in the private uh, banking system. You cannot take it out. And uh, that could infuse some instability and, and bank runs and so on. So the central bank has to think about a way how they can still offer public money without counterparty risk to, to their citizens. And hence the idea of central bank digital currency was born. So it's it's it sounds, or it is often painted as a as a tool for government control, and they can uh, like s switch it off whenever they want, and then you can't buy food, and that uh, I think that's all nonsense, and it's it's uh, uh, usually well, I'm not I'm I'm not gonna. Uh, paint anybody in, into a corner, but it's, it's, it's usually conspiracy theories and, and um, not helpful to the overall discussion. So um, uh, central banks, yeah, they, they, uh, all major central banks are working on it. And um, uh, I think it's indispensable for the, for the, um, for the health of the monetary system to have a CBDC. But I, I totally admit it's it's not easily comprehensible why, why we need it, but um, it is that most of the money that's in circulation is privately created and it has counterparty risk and the, the central bank is the only institution that cannot go bankrupt because they can always print uh, money. Mm -hmm. No, I really like that analogy too, especially because, you know, when I consider how many times a day I use this thing to pay for something, and I know yeah, certain countries like India are, you know, like going towards cashless. I didn't realize that it was Sweden, I think is what you said, was uh, yeah. one of the most. That's, that's really interesting. That's a really good way of thinking, like, if we do go cashless, like, what's the natural implication? You have to have something to, you know, sort of fill that gap. Yeah, yeah. And I mean... Uh, CBDC, yes, it uh, it would be nice if it's programmable. Um, for example, you, you think about the the COVID stimulus checks. I mean, the, the how long it took to send to mail them out, and um, there was an issue with the signature of the president and stuff like that. With a CBDC, you if if you have a wallet, I mean, you can credit it with an you know instantly, and you could uh, why programmability because you could say uh, spend it or lose it in the next two months because what happened with the stimulus checks was uh, the savings rate exploded and the US went to the highest since at least the 1960s the, like it hit more than 30 percent and people paid down their credit balances which is fine but it doesn't help the economy in, in, a, in a pandemic in a when the economy is collapsing so you, you want people to spend the money that they got for free and a programmable CBDC would be would be a, a fantastic tool for that. But of course, this brings uh, all the fears about government control and so on. Um, another issue, uh, another uh, feature could be um, that in, in, in very limited instances like food stamps, for example, today you get a uh, EBT electronic benefits transfer card that looks like a, um, a visa card or so basically a debit card and already there you can't buy tobacco or alcohol with it 
And with uh, CBDC, you could theoretically program it so that um, recipients of government support cannot buy alcohol or tobacco. Because if if this was possible, I mean, the outcry would be huge, right? Uh, the government funds uh, alcohol and tobacco addictions. <laughs> uh, that wouldn't go down too well. So it's it's in these very specific circumstances that programmability of CBDC um, that would be would be really an improvement. Oh, that's a really really interesting point. I know my girls. Uh, I like them. I have a, a nine year old and a five year old. Though they they feel them like nineteen and you know fifteen at times. I let them you know kind of go on Amazon and you know we did sort of a thought experiment. I was like, all right, I. I have, you know, I told, I didn't tell them how much the stimmy was, but I was like, all right, you got 30 bucks, you know, how are you going to go spend it? Let's go stimulate this economy. <laughs> I think they bought um, a Disney doll, I don't remember which one, and some bath toys. But, you know, it, it was sort of their first foray into it. And I always like to teach my Sunday school kids when we get to Zacchaeus about like taxation, you know, it's just financial literacy, I think is something as well as like investing literacy is something yeah. that, you know, we, we have a long way to go to as, as a society. And I, I really like a lot of the, the things that you put out. You know, like I, I frankly learned a lot in this conversation. Um, it, as we kind of wrap up, where are, if people are interested in learning more about, you know, you, your work, a lot of your really well thought out opinions, you know, where should they check out? Where are you active on social media? I'm on, on LinkedIn. Uh, you can search for Alexander Gloy and, um, I have kind of a pen name on Twitter, uh, Glushi, G-L-O-E-S-C-H-I, uh, under the uh, name of Macro Tourist, because uh, you know I call myself just a t uh, like Nouriel Rubini. Uh, he calls people who opine about macro without knowing much about it macro tourists. Uh, oh. So. Um, yeah, there. But uh, uh, longer stuff on on LinkedIn, definitely. And then I write for some uh, publications, but it's always posted on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Oh, very cool. Well, Alex, thank you. It's uh, it's been fun having you on. I, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I Absolutely. Have. Thanks for having me. Yeah. No, it's funny. We actually met through a generative AI conference, uh, probably October, or September of last year. You never know who you're going to meet. It's always good to connect with people afterwards. And, you know, maybe you interview them for a webcast, you know, exactly. <laughs> never would have imagined this. Yeah. So, no, I uh, thank you all very much for, for watching and we'll see you in the future.